So, so I, um, you know, obviously I, I miss uh, everything involving all the stuff that we've done together. Um, and I've been uh, sort of thinking quite a bit about um, just so some of the topics that I would uh, ruminate on regarding jiu-jitsu and like, you know, why is it important? Is it useful? And sort of these kind of things. Um, and then shifting more into um, thinking about teaching online as like something I would just like to continue doing even after I uh, reopen a new, a new space for robot. Um, and a big part of that is because I think there's something um, uh, about jujitsu that once you do it, you sort of understand it has these, I'm, I'm just going to say like almost magical qualities that it can, can bring out in a person or between different people or whatever it is. Um, that's easy to sort of, uh, you know, not really give it the time of day for before you're engaged with it. Um, but I actually think that there are some ways where um, it can be broken down and, and students can really understand why do I have this feeling that like jujitsu practice is actually productive and good for me and it's not really that I feel like I'm just getting good at fighting there's something else that's going on it's like something about meeting friends something about uh, meeting people that I would not maybe have met otherwise and sort of having this way of engaging with them with with sparring and drilling that is uh, you know, you could describe it as, as uh, intimate in one way or like a camaraderie in another way. And you get you get to build a relationship um, where you may not have even been interested in building one before. You know, and I constantly think about some of the dynamics, like especially during the, during the noontime class uh, when you guys would come in, I'm like, how would Dave Bentley meet Veronica in a way where they were just laughing and having a great time? And it's like, well, we're here. Or like, Alex Sherrigan, like, I freaking love that guy. And like, I don't know if his his specific disposition is like, he's going to be able to meet all of these different people, but he did it robot, you know? Um, and so I've been thinking about these things quite a bit. And I wanted to try and incorporate some of that with the lesson that we did today. Um, almost any time I try something like this, I, I go to a lesson I've taught a number of times before, so that part can sort of be um, already set. And some of the newer ideas that I've, I've um, uh, that I'm still working through myself, um, I can put a little more of my conscious effort on them. And so um, I want to propose one of the uh, first ideas, which is. I think what makes jiu-jitsu uh, so useful, so interesting, so beautiful and such a, a wonderful thing for people to do together is that it is the best serious game that human beings have come up with. Okay, and a serious game is uh, is a term um, that was coined by a, you know somebody that I'll, I'll go into later. But um, essentially, it has a few qualities. It allows for us to learn and have um, failure states that aren't punishing to us. They're uh, fun and engaging, um, but also a serious game allows us to think about things like strategy, mechanics, and and to dive into things that require some actual focus. Um, it's not just entertainment. It's not a game for game's sake. It's a serious game. And I think that uh, Jiu Jitsu as a serious game is quite useful also because it's not just a mental deliberation and it's not just a game of tag where if I'm faster than you and I can run for longer, guess who's going to win? You know, it, it, it allows you to, to take some of your, uh, your, your intellect some of your physicality, and it allows you to scale that up and down with the person you're training with, okay? Um, and the first way that happens in jiu-jitsu that is very different than even related martial arts is um, the introduction of very high stakes, or at least stakes that are as close to catastrophic failures we can get. When I say that, I mean being strangled, right? So um, when we're when we're doing this, doing this on an online, um, uh, forum. One thing that often surprises people, I know you guys have done this with me before, but for other folks that don't know, if you just take your two hands and you put them here, like, you're, like your hands are cold and you just want to get them warm, and then you just look down slowly, you'll begin, it's not fast, it's not fast, but you'll begin to feel the effects of strangulation. And that's you doing it to yourself with control. Um, so the point of that is this catastrophic failure that we can create doesn't take a whole lot. But the, so the stakes can be super high. We're playing this game. The goal is strangle and 
If that resolves, okay, well now I've got a, we're, we have a game with some real stakes to it. But if the stakes are just high and that's it, well, how do you separate that from a nuclear arms race? How do you separate that from just general fighting or, or other rivalrous activities? Well, uh, it's actually because in, in, and this is one of the beautiful things about jujitsu, it is able to push the limit on the stakes, really push them up as high as they'll go, but also maximizing safety. Okay, and this is super important because if it's, if it's, if, I mean, you obviously see why. If it involved hang gliding or something like that, you've already wiped a whole bunch of your, your potential students off the map already. But even when compared to other grappling martial arts like judo or wrestling, where you start standing, most of jujitsu can be done relatively close to the floor. It's very stable and it's very safe overall. So we have this very odd combination that turns out to be super, super useful where the stakes go way up but also safety stays super high. Yes, of course, sometimes people get injured, etc. cetera. Um, that, that, that aside, the nature of this serious game is, is interesting to uh, deliberate on. So with that in mind, let's review the rear naked strangle from the back. Let's just go some over some of the nuts and bolts in that. Um, and obviously while we're doing that, you're gonna see some of the other devices that are in play that allow for safety to be high, that allow for us to test Am I really in a position where I could uh, strangle the person unconscious if it really came to that? And these sorts of uh, different variables. So we usually start off with the kneeling position here. And in general, whenever you start off like this, it's just to simplify the number of things you're having to, to process when you're learning this. Um, you both know about placing hooks in and things like that, but we're gonna set that aside for now. Now, okay. now, a good uh, starting point is if you're right-handed, I'm right-handed, is I take my right hand, it goes over the top, I take my left hand, I go underneath, and I'm gonna join my hands together. Now, joining my hands together allows me to connect my sternum to her spine. So you never wanna have a situation where you're sort of like giving somebody a, a reluctant hug or something like this. You wanna be, okay, we're close and you're not going anywhere. You'll notice that when I do that, I place my joints in a very specific way. I go over one of her shoulders, under one of her armpits, and the overarm, I take my elbow to her shoulder. So if you just pay attention to this arm here, I'm act actively pulling on her shoulder here. If I said, hey, Emmy, can you look to the left here? It's hard for her to do. If I were to move my elbow up, real easy to turn. It's not this grip that's controlling her, it's this elbow controlling her shoulder. That's how my hands can eventually be free and go off into useful things, okay? On the other side, we're coming underneath and I would really like to take my strangle hand, my dominant hand, and place it right next to her armpit and then cover it up. So that if this whole grip thing that I have going on here fails, I could at least hide my hand in her armpit and she would not be able to, to access it there. So it's sort of a, a several layers of uh, protecting this, this important strangle hand. Okay, so we've come over the top. We've got that elbow in front of the shoulder. We're using that to control the, the turn of the body. I go under the opposite arm and I link my hands together. Now, I wanna be able to feel her ear against my ear like this. Okay, being able to turn my head and use the back of my head is totally fine, but at, at the minimum, we wanna be ear to ear. A lot of times, again, if I'm like this, it's just because I don't wanna shout in the person's ear, but you always come in and everything fits nice and snug here, okay? So that's my initial grip, okay? And that's what's gonna give me the uh, beginnings of the rear mount on my partner. What Emmy wants to do is to immediately place her hands in a defensive position. So we're gonna switch positions real quick and so you, so you can see what that looks like. Okay. So I'm just talking to you guys and Emmy sneaks up on me. Oh, she's gonna go for a strangle, but she sets up her grip and I know my defensive hands here. This is her strangle arm. My left arm will always want to match up to her right arm. My left arm is 99 plus percent of my defense here. And it comes from that shape of the, sort of the webbing between the thumb and the first finger. Okay, so I'm aiming that webbing as close as possible to her right thumb. If I can have you open your hands real quick. I would love it if I could go like this and grab the meat of her, of her thumb line here, okay? Usually that's, that's hidden, so you'll end up somewhere on the wrist, okay? But if you can get to the thumb, that's great. But again, she did her sneak attack, so that's not really happening. I go thumb in, 
and the webbing between my thumb and first finger, this is the majority of my defense. When this goes wrong, when I end up using this hand to do other things, that's when real big problems start to, start to cascade. So the left hand goes in, the right hand comes in and holds over my own thumb. Okay, so now I'm protecting that exact same area that I was trying to grab on her. Okay, so we sort of create this stack with our hands. She's got her right, her left is stacked on top, my left is stacked on top of that, and then my right goes on top there. So if we just were to start this at the beginning, she comes in, she does her stack, left on top of right, I do my stack, left, and then I put the right on top here. Okay, and you can think of this right hand as acting as a reinforcement for my left hand. Okay, um, and this is just a good general defensive position for my hands. It allows me to monitor what this arm is doing, whether she's trying to strangle or develop the position in some other way. I know where it is and I know that I'm not getting led into other traps where the legs come over and trap my arms and stuff like that. Okay, always avoid doing this sort of thing and especially doing this sort of thing here. Okay, because when you actually pull here, her hands can easily separate, go into my lapel and do all kinds of crazy stuff here. So this is sort of like that. Uh, I just want to grab something because so, so it hopefully doesn't get worse. That, that's not going to do it. Trust that webbing of the thumb and first finger, lodge it in and then reinforce it and cover it up. And you'll also notice that I do try to clamp my elbows down immediately as well. I don't want her changing this configuration, pulling her arms out of here and doing different things. So I kind of hold on to this in place. Okay, so let's switch again. So we've got my initial grip and then her initial grip. My initial grip goes dominant hand over and then helping hand goes out, goes in and covers it up. I'm focusing on my elbow being in front of her shoulder here. Then she comes in with defensive hands, stacking them up and then reinforcing them. Mm -hmm. in. Yep. You can go this way. Yeah. Okay, so we've got our stack of hands here. Now, if, um, if, it ever, if it's ever possible, I always wanna take my helping hand here and I wanna just peel her hands off of mine. Now, maybe we'll come a little bit closer so that we can see what's going on. So when she has her defensive hands in place here, what I always want to do is find that thumb line. It's always the same thing we're returning to, that, that vulnerable thumb line. If I can get to the thumb line, then I'm not pulling on her thumb. I'm just putting my thumb in, almost like um, you're going to flick up a Pez dispenser. Okay, just a little bit of a wedge that gets things going. And then what happens is I roll my wrist forward like I'm doing a forward throttle. Okay, so it's not a pluck right now. And it's not just a, a pull in, in some haphazard direction. I take my thumb and I get right into her thumb and I forward roll my wrist. Okay, now because of the way that my elbow and forearm are stacked with her elbow and forearm, I can actually do the same thing by just turning my right hand towards me and it comes free. I'm going to do this whole thing without M here so it's a little easier to see what my hands are doing and then we'll come back to this scenario. Okay. So I have this sort of grip here. And what I was looking to do is use my helping hand to help out and I seek their thumb line, okay? I would just seek to get into the thumb line, right in this area. Once I can get there, I'm just gonna roll my wrist forward and that will take off the first grip. Okay, so if you can imagine, I've got my grip, I've got my thumb in and I'm rolling the wrist forward. Because of the way that our remaining hands would be arranged, it's easy for me to just roll my wrist a second time and free it completely. So even though she did a good job with her defensive hands, it's not that hard for me to peel them apart, get them free, and go on and do the next thing I need to do. Okay, so let's look at this one more time. So we come in, we create our initial grips here. She creates her uh, defensive grips. Yep, and now I take my free hand here and I go in and I find her thumb. Sometimes, uh, because of the, you know, in this situation, my hands are quite a bit larger than Emmy's, I can probably just grab both of her hands. I wouldn't recommend getting too used to that because you're gonna go against someone who's got gorilla hands at some point and you're not gonna be able to make that work. So I go to just her thumb line on the top hand and I peel that one off. I turn my other wrist towards me and that gets rid of the whole thing. Now I've got this free, uncontested hand that can just go crazy with strangles and all kinds of stuff over here. Okay, yeah, I know, I know. There's like all kinds of imaginative things. We can go lapel, we can go straight to the rear naked, 
But a lot of times what I, what I notice um, people will struggle with is they'll do this part right. They know the seat, they're like, oh, seat belt, Marcelo Garcia. I'm Marcelo Garcia now. Now I'm Marce Marcelo Garcia. And then somebody stacks their hands up on top of their, their hands like this and they're like, uh, and they start trying to, fly, and they end up pulling so hard. And if M just releases a little bit for a moment, their own hands fly way back and the person's just gone, right? You actually want to keep this whole thing really compacted together when you win this hand fight so that their hands are glued to their own chest and then your hand is just free to go right to the neck, okay? So we want to refrain from, from sort of like trying to pull your arm out of here and removing it. That's what they want. Instead, we're here. We just seek out that thumb line. Once we find it, we just do a nice little forward throttle and then I do a backwards throttle. So they go in opposite directions, left hand forward, right hand towards me. Once that's free, sometimes you can punch right through and around to the neck. But once somebody has a sense that their hands have just been defeated like this, they're almost in instinctively gonna bring their chin to their sternum like this. Okay, and then we'll go through the rest of the operations that get us into the rear naked strangle. Okay, so we'll just take a, a pause on that for a moment. Um, the big idea there was I had a specific set of grips and I wanted to be able to free my hands to win a hand fight. One of the key elements to doing that is making sure that elbow is in front of their shoulder. If that elbow is not in front of their shoulder, guess what? You get into the hand fight, their shoulder's moving. Now you've got three problems plus 10 more problems. Not, not going to work out. Set that elbow in front. Then you can really clamp everything close and focus on a simple hand fight, which is always to get to their thumb line and roll the wrist and then peel your own wrist towards you. Okay. And then you've essentially won the first major battle of the hand fight. Um, now the next part, we've gotten past the hands, uh, in, in this sort of kneeling position. And because we're in a kneeling position, she really only has one line of defense left and that's putting her chin down. Okay. Um, if we were, uh, fully engaging with the legs, she would be able to move from one side to the other. And that's not all that difficult to deal with, but again, we'll just, we'll just focus on this for now. So again, everything's the same. We're just coming in, we're putting that elbow in front. I'm stacking up my hands. I'm making sure my ear at the minimum, the back of my head at the maximum is flush here. And I get a nice good grip here where I can hide my hand under her armpit or otherwise keep my strangle hands safe from her defensive hands. Her defensive hands come up. She starts reaching for mine. Oh, and this is a good note here. You'll notice that Emmy is obviously putting both of her defensive hands towards my strangle hand. First starts her left, to my right and then her right reinforcing her left. Clearly if she were to grab my helping hand with her two hands here, yeah. Yeah, like if she were to do this, I would just say, yeah, go ahead, have it. And then I get to go to the neck. That will happen on occasion, especially if you're sort of be going through multiple, multiple hand fights where it resets a couple of times, that will happen. But by and large, people will quickly learn to only grab the strangle hand. But if they don't, if they grab that top hand, just treat it like they grabbed the sheath. You let the sheath go, there's your knife, okay? So we're gripped up here. She goes in defensive hands and I can feel she's grabbing my right hand. So that means my left is free, which is perfectly fine. I go to her thumb line. I roll her forward, I roll my wrist towards me, and I feel that her chin goes down to her sternum. Now, my favorite part is where we use the politician hand and we politically convince them of this. No, we, we, we use, I'm gonna get close to you guys and see this. Um, you make a sort of, almost like a, if you were like mimicking a trigger finger type of thing, but really closing that index finger and then putting your thumb on top of it. What you're trying to do is make a point out of this knuckle here. And then you're gonna to try to take your thumb and push that point forward. So that if somebody comes in and tries to, you know, smack it on the top and all this, it doesn't, it doesn't give it all. It's got a nice sharp point to it. And this is gonna be our little digging tool that we use to, to get under the chin. So we're here, her hands come in. I use my second hand to peel her hand off. I roll my wrist forward. I feel her chin has gone down. I immediately make that point with my first finger, reinforce it with my thumb. Now here's the key. Don't go clubbing the front of their face here and, and, and try to get to the strangle. Go back and behind their ear. It's nice and wide by the back, uh, by, uh, behind the ear. And so with just a little bit 
you can convince them that lifting their chin up is a good idea. Now, the way I would do this is, if you notice here, the way that your jaw is sort of shaped, it's sort of like a, a triangle that gets more narrow as it gets towards the center of the throat. Try to start behind the ear, up at the top by the jawline. And as you get closer to the middle of the chin, shoot it like an arrow straight across the throat. So you're not actually circling fully in front of the throat, okay? You're starting by circling the front of the throat. Then you wanna punch across when you get to right around to their trachea because it's really, really uncomfortable when somebody does that to you and people will um, almost reflexively lift their chin up a little bit more, okay? Um, if they don't, then there's other things you can do, but it's a great like subtlety that you pick up on after you do it a bunch of times. So we've already won this, this uh, hand right here. Emma has her hands in. I've already trapped one of them and I've drawn back. I've got my politician hand here. I'm gonna try to pass that budget through Congress. <laughs> and I get my pointed knuckle behind her ear at the wide part of her jaw. And I start slicing, 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 but then I punch across and I flip up her chin like a Pez dispenser. Once this narrow part of my thumb and wrist is in, it's really easy to slide the rest of my forearm in and we can start hugging the back of the shoulder. This grip here, I'll, I'll show in a second, is sort of an intermediary grip. It's not really what I wanna end with. What I wanna end with is one that's behind her head, okay? But because this breakthrough happens and it's so, so dangerous for M, I have to be ready for her defensive hands to come up and start prying on my arm and trying to drag it down. So it's important I'm able to grab something once I make the breakthrough, okay? So if we turn this a little bit. So what I mean is, imagine you're M here, and I've just made a breakthrough where my, my wrist went through, oh, so it's here, where I get under the chin, my wrist has made it through, and we're right about here. If I was only able to complete this by going all the way around the back of her head, she may be speedy enough to get up to my thumb line, and just like all the other hand fights, this can, this can create some problems. So what I want to be able to do is to fold my wrist here in a way that makes my thumb inaccessible. Generally, it's that false grip that we're always looking to use. So we form a false grip wherever we can, and it's our head position covering our thumb. So now my head is sort of playing that assistant role in making sure that my, my strangle hand is not compromised. Now that might mean that I have to finger walk a little bit down the shoulder and then convert this to the back of the head. That's all totally fine. The easiest thing in the world is just to remember that your thumb line is really the vulnerability in this whole exchange. So there are different sort of creative ways you can go about protecting it. You can be fairly speedy and get right to the back of the head. Or if that's not really working out, you can go here to the uh, behind the sh shoulder right on the scapula and just cover it up with your head and then just slowly work your way into a more favorable position. Okay. One of the lessons about hand fights is, is always this idea that it's the thumb line that determines who wins and loses the hand fight. And people that are very good at hand fighting have creative, um, a few creative ways to overcome people seeking out their thumb line or ways to recover and things like this. Okay, um, so I'm gonna pause for just a second here. I know I just, uh, I don't know how long it's been, but like I just went on for a little bit. Um, did I, did anybody have any questions or anything up to this point? Um, everyone able to hear me okay? Uh, it, anything at all? Kai, it's good to see you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. We moved. Oh yeah. Looks like you still. Across the street. <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> Jeff, is everything making sense for you so far? It is. I'm, okay. I'm, uh, uh, my, only my only real question is not about technique, but frequency, frequency of finishing, finishing with rear naked versus going for a lapel choke. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I, I want to get into uh, today as well. Um, I'll put. Let me give you the the quick summary. If you have a gi on, um, you should. The way you should think about it is this is always going to be a stronger, more reliable finish. There's going to be times when you're rolling with somebody and you you're on their back and you need something to work on because you just have trounced them several times in a row. And it's fine to, to work the rear naked strangle there. Um, uh, but but in, in general, it's more powerful to use the lapel. It's a little bit easier uh, because there are different ways to finagle that grip that you want. Um, and it sort of teaches 
different lesson, sort of some of the things that you do when you finish with the lapel are exactly opposite of what you do when you finish with the rear naked. And those are the kinds of lessons that I really think help you uh, put useful placeholders in your jujitsu. I'll go over one of them right now, just to give you a real concrete example. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to return to it. If not today, then, then tomorrow. All right, uh, something back here. Hmm? Something on your back here and you yeah. So when we, when we come in for the, um, and we know we're gonna be using the lapels, if we're anywhere close in skill or size or whatever, I'm definitely looking for lapels as a way to finish. Rear naked strangle is something odd or really out of the ordinary happened if we're wearing a gi. Um, but yeah, using the lapel is really the way to go. Uh, the, it always will start off the same way here. And the simple check that you'll want to use uh, when, you're, when you're working with the lapel is in some way, shape, or form, you need to get their lapel with no slack and a grip in your hand where if you were to back away, you need to see that first index knuckle. Okay? So there's all kinds of like, you can fold the lapel like this. You could be kind of low on the lapel like this and then pull your elbow behind the shoulder. The, all the, just so many things, there's not everything, but just all that it comes down to is, can I see my index knuckle? If yes, proceed, okay? That's such a valuable rule that it lets you sort of be creative with all the other, what about a really loose grip? Yeah, well you just gotta really wrench your elbow behind and then you'll be fine. Um, another good one uh, for lapels, um, you know I'm a big fan of, of having certain tests that you do to make sure that your mechanics are correct. If you set the collar strangle properly, it shouldn't require a full fist like this. It's useful, um, but really it should be able to be done with just these two fingers right here. And that, that's, that has to do with the sort of rope, the fact that you're grabbing kind of like a, a, a thin rope here instead of your own limbs, right? Um, and so I should be able to set everything mechanically so that even with just these uh, little pincers here, you'll be able to get a strangle. Um, another uh, useful uh, dichotomy between the rear naked strangle and the collar strangle is you'll notice when I'm working uh, nogi, I'm always crowding with the head. I'm always insisting on the head position in order to make this fit happen. That's all true with uh, when we use the lapel up until the point where I'm ready to finish. Now, of course, there would be hooks involved um, and things like this. But once I'm ready to finish, I don't want to sit here trying to pull. I actually want to let my head hang back. And it's a, and yeah, and we'll tell you like, <laughs> there's an immediate difference in that feeling. The, the thing that you want to feel is I pull the slack out of the gi by twisting, and that allows me to throw my body weight away from my, my partner. And because I'm twisting in opposite directions, it's, it works. I mean, I wish there was a better example of this, but it works basically like a noose, you know? And you twist, pull, and then you just throw your body weight and they're not gonna be able to do anything about it. Um, oftentimes you can steer people around the mat using that exact movement to then later on get your hooks in or to then later on recover leg positionings that maybe didn't work. Um, one example of that would be if I'm here with them and I've got my hooks in like this, most of the time, uh, and for good reason, I recommend that you fall towards the underside arm, just because of how easy it is to use this leg to trap the arm, right? But if you ever were in a situation where you manage this grip, or even manage two grips here, and they thought they were being so smart going to the opposite side like this, this grip allowed me to just take off my bottom hook, take off my top hook, and use my hook to turn her, because I know but because I've got these grips, I can just pull myself up and reestablish the entire position. Um, that's very, very hard to do with a rear naked strangle. It's very easy to do with a seatbelt and incredibly easy to do with lapel grips, right? Um, so just to recap, if you're using lapels, your marker, your, your check for am I doing this right, is can I see that index knuckle when I make my grip? That's my minimum. How, whatever means I use to get there, perfect. When it's time to finish, the big difference is you move your head away, away, away. You don't keep it close like you would for a rear naked strangle. Um, does that make sense, Jeff? Awesome. Kai, you got any questions, bud? No, okay. Um, so, uh, 
The, the other uh, check we should uh, we should look at is when we get a little bit further along on the rear naked strangle, we're closing it up, we're thinking we're ready to finish, and we just want to make sure that we're not um, we're not uh, leaving out any efficiency that might might be accessible to us. So if I'm here and I got it in the back, and we've managed to make it all the way through seatbelt grip, she goes defensive hands. I go offensive hands. I start rolling my wrist free. She tucks her chin, politician hand coming to the rescue. I get right under, uh, right by the corner of her jaw behind the ear. I pez dispenser her jaw and I punch everything through. I do what it takes to cover my, my thumb. First it's my head position, then eventually I get to behind her head. Now I retract my helper hand here and I expect two hands to come up and start just scraping away at my arm, just frantically clawing at my arm, just blood curdling, no, she's gonna be pulling at my arm to try and get it off. This is the first test you should get used to. I've got my thumb hidden, I've got my head right over top of my own hand, and Em can go ahead and pull on my arm all she wants. I don't want to be too presumptuous, but I'm going to spoil this for everyone. She's not going to break my grip here. Um, and if she could, you know, we'd want to investigate that a little bit. Um, usually what, what happens is people will uh, visually cover their thumb with their head. But when somebody is finagling their, their dexterous fingers in there, they'll still find it. Let's do it like this. That looked pretty similar to what I was doing before. So I'm not so concerned about how far does my thumb go. It's just, can you feel your thumb flush against your neck and jaw? Because if it's flush to your neck and jaw, this is not getting in there. So we go around the corner, there. I can feel my thumb against my right ear. M comes in trying to claw, my, uh, claw herself free. And we're good to go. Now, if we turn a little bit. Now this next part, there's, a, there's actually a few different things that can happen um, in large part because they will become increasingly, um, uh, let's say desperate, let's say willing to take bigger risks because things are really starting to uh, become a big problem for them. So the function of this helping hand can take a couple different forms. I'm just gonna go over maybe two of them um, because they sort of cover both ends of the spectrum here. Okay, so let's say we've got this in place now I've got this helping hand. I may have been down here controlling her wrist. I may have been occupied at some point, but now I retract my hand. And the first thing I'm looking to do is to use my forearm like a brace in my partner's back. Okay. By bracing in my partner's back like this, I make it possible for my two wrists to cross over each other. The real big problem here is you don't want to be going like this and exposing all that hidden thumb work you did to their hands. So I've got my thumb hidden. I take my left forearm and I essentially prop her up with my hands here. Now I can lock my hands together in a gable grip, perfectly fine. A lot of times I'll use this and I'll essentially punch the, the grip deeper. It's like I'm sawing it around the neck even more just to get a more flush contact. Not always necessary, but the key element here is that when it's time to convert from this hand-to-hand uh, -hand choke into a full rear naked, is that we cross the wrist. My left goes forward and around so that this right thumb is never shown. Here's my head covering it. We slide everything through. And you'll notice what's happening is my left elbow is advancing from bracing behind to covering in front. Just like when we started with the seatbelt, now I've got two elbows in front of two shoulders. And we're gonna use this to sort of fold our partner up a little bit for the finish. Okay, so we had our initial, we came in, gable grip is fine, nice little checkpoint here. I go crossing at the wrists. Now I finger crawl, finger crawl, elbow in front of her shoulder. Now the whole thing is I want to touch her uh, forehead towards her sternum and then just rotate her to the floor and that'll give you the finish. Okay. Ideal scenario is to have your rear naked strangle grip where your strangle hand goes wrist deep on your own arm. And then if possible, this hand goes wrist deep towards your tricep. Right below, right in here, that's where their neck is. So you can see that not being wrist deep increases that 
area, area, I think, uh, something, <laughs> something's increasing in there and, and we want to be decreasing things in there, right? <laughs> so wrist deep is a good cue. It's always solidify that strangle hand first, crawl it up and into place. Then the support hand, it goes as far as it can. It may not be that far. If your partner's a lot smaller than you, it might be quite far. And then it's all about using two elbows to fold them forward. Once you fold them forward, you're thinking about putting them face down to the floor. Okay. And that brings us back right to the beginning where we were here. We fold forward and we turn everything to the ground. Okay. And so, you know, just going, uh, actually, hold on. I don't know if you guys saw what I just saw. <laughs> there's a, there's a Mr. Dave Bentley in the room now. Hey, how you doing? Ooh. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, um, Awesome, awesome. Man, it's really, it's really nice to see all of you guys. I mean, <laughs> I knew that was gonna be the case, but like, I'm just, also it is really nice to see you guys. Um, so yeah, that, that's like a little bit of a, the, some of the, some of the, the big uh, things you wanna have in mind when you're doing the rear naked strangle. Um, and I, I really like to emphasize those because we're referencing specific joints, elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist, um, and those are not very gray areas. Um, I find that it's harder for students to, to retain information when it's just like, I move my arm to this general area. It's go until your wrist folds forward and then you know you're done. Then the next step, get your second wrist all the way through. You know you're done. Use two elbows instead of one to fold them forward, so forth and so on. Um, the other thing to keep in mind though is because we're being quite particular about um, each individual step and where you're grabbing, how you're grabbing, and the, the order, um, it's not to say you won't run into problems, but you will run into fairly similar predictable problems, which is good. You, you, know, you don't wanna run into 100 different problems. You've got two or three problems that you just can't seem to crack open, um, and usually the answer to those are like, oh, why didn't I think that myself kind of thing. Um, but do try to keep that in mind, like you're gonna have success and then people are gonna catch on. And when they catch on, it's almost like you're gonna hit a wall and it doesn't work at all because it's, it's this, you're using a very mechanical step-by-step uh, -step method. And if you can't, uh, if you're not sure which step you're doing incorrectly or what the follow-up should be, they're gonna keep stopping you at that same step over and over. Um, and last note on that is, let's say you do, uh, 20, um, you practice this 20 times and you try to have your partner get out. Um, if, if obviously if something, if they escape 12 times using one particular method and then four more, four other varieties kind of sprinkled in there, leave those four alone. They're not that significant. The one that happened 12 times, if you fix that, it's probably going to fix those other ones too. Um, those other four were probably not even intentional. They were just uh, available because of the error that led the, to those first 12 uh, in, in the first place. Um, Jeff, any, uh, any questions up to this point? Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can understand uh, human gestures and expressions and things like that. My, my AI bot in my, is, is programmed up to that. <laughs> Kai, any... Uh, Oh no, Kai just smacked the question out of his head. I don't know if you guys can all see each other, but uh, Kai is about as close to bouncing off the walls as you can get. <laughs> Dave, any questions? Any thoughts? No, no. All right. No, no, no I'm just, 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 just going to pop in and, and say hello. Sorry, I'm there and I thought I'd pop in quickly. Oh yeah, well I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. it oh, can I can I ask you guys while I have you? Um, so I'm happy to do Tuesdays. Uh, um, I'm happy to do every day, whatever. But like. Uh, is there, uh, if I did Tuesdays at 6.30, um, would you guys be available Wednesday 6.30 or Thursday 6.30s? Or is there any, any uh, votes for something? I'm not, I'm not sure, sure about, about me. me. Okay, I mean, you don't have to decide now, but, but I would like to add stuff as, as fits your guys' schedule. I'm pissed because I missed you, professor. professor. <laughs> Wait, who, who said that? Everybody. Everybody. Oh, <laughs> wow. No, awesome. no, it's, it's cheese. cheese. Oh, <laughs> hey, Mike, what's up? Where? How? 
I don't know how you're doing this. Are you are you hacking? Are you hacking? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Have we been hacked? Yeah. <laughs> No, you gonna, oh, I was I was I'm I'm now, now at uh, USKO US in Anaheim, Anaheim so, 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 so as I was leaving, leaving I got email you know that you guys were doing, doing it, and I was like, oh, let me hop on and listen to what I'm talking about while I'm driving home. Uh huh. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, feel free to take the lesson. I won't. I won't be offended. You can. You can. You can reteach this lesson. It's it's okay. I've done it a few times. It's it's kind of refined. I mean, I mean, actually. I like, I like the, the like, like when I was hacking the back, the back I never, I never actually, actually like thought about, about, about the context of attacking the thumb line and where that applies to my, to my back control. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. That was, that was like really, really, really dynamic. And we're just like, like as, as I'm driving, I'm over here. I'm thinking like, huh? That makes a lot of sense both in my retention and and in my defense. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I don't know if you guys know, Mike is a very impressive purple belt, maybe even brown belt now. I don't, I'm not brown sure. Belt, but brown belt now, yeah. so that's uh, a little bit of oh, yeah. credibility right there. Oh, social, social media, media I saw it. it. No. There's, there's, a, there, there's always, uh, what's the best way to say it? For each uh, joint structure and joint uh, system where, um, there's always a best way to win that battle. And, and hand fighting is very obvious. It's my hands versus your hands. And most of those battles are won at the thumb line. Um, this is in part because the rules, you know, you can't grab individual fingers. You're sort of like pushing up against the rules in that you can grab this meaty part of the thumb as long as the remainder of your hand is over their knuckles, totally fine. And it's sort of the, um, it's the most efficient uh, way that you're allowed to operate, and it's relatively safe. Um, almost every hand fight is won or lost by who can maintain control of the thumb line or can roll the thumb line and then pull the hand out, um, because always that weakness in your grip is where your, your middle finger meets your thumb. So when you're trying to bust out, right? Whenever you want to bust out of one of these grips, it's always going to be through that connection of the thumb and the middle finger. So if I'm gripped like this, I don't want to try and like phase through and try and get my hand free. It's always a matter of just pulling, thinning my wrist and then pulling it towards me to win that hand fight. So in a, in a hand fight where it's hands versus hands, it's always going to be who dominates the thumb line. Do you grab theirs and pull yours free or, or what have you. But what, what's also interesting is you start to think about, well, what about hands versus elbows or what about hands versus shoulders or what about elbows versus you and you can create any number of permutations you want um, but they are going to come up at some point in jiu-jitsu and, and what you'll start to see is that part, certain joints are generally suited for certain tasks hands for example obviously gripping manipulating and actually almost like antennae telling giving you information about what's going on you know you try to find your your keys in a backpack in a dark room you can do it and you can use sensitivity in you know, in your hands your elbows though are okay for grabbing at best your shoulder terrible for grabbing unless you're getting something in the armpit you can hold it there um, so my hand helps me attach so that my elbow can reinforce and then my shoulder can turn and you start to see that each joint it because of its actual shape the way the bone is shaped the way the the, the joint itself operates is best suited for some particular tasks that we have um, jiu-jitsu sort of requires you to have all of them all your joints can be optimized in some way and be used for some uh, particular purpose um, and then if you start watching like other sports you see how a lot of those sports are focusing in on one or two sets of joints and you can actually learn quite a bit by studying them for example the olympic rings that's just a shoulder mobility test it's a fantastic one you need a lot of shoulder mobility and strength to do it but it's essentially built on who's got the most uh, strength and mobility in their shoulders and it's amazing what people can do when they have a lot of it um, tennis is actually quite a bit of elbow and wrist very interesting in that regard the way that your wrist may turn over as you hit the ball i don't know anything about tennis but i've watched a little bit of it the way your wrist might turn over um, 
for uh, ankles, which often give people a lot of trouble. They, they're, people are like scared of their own ankles. You, you see them get put in a footlock and they tap as soon as the person whispers footlock. Ah! And it's like, it's understandable because how should my ankle work? Where, where, where is it safe? Where is it not? Um, and the best um, manifestation of that that I've seen is ballet. You know, there's the whole architecture is built on, on the ankle. Um, and so each joint sort of has a particular task that it's uh, suited for, especially when compared to the joints proximal to it. Right, so elbow is good for elbow stuff, especially compared to shoulder and hand. Okay, um, your knee is also pretty good, but sometimes your knee is not by your elbow. So what are you gonna do? Um, there was one other thing I wanted to uh, to mention on that note. Um, what was it? Oh, just when you're when you're moving around. I know I've said this to you guys before, but it's it's always worth keeping in mind. You know, you, you're you're moving around with your partner. You're paying attention to what they're doing. You're trying to uh, to express as much as you know in some particular moment. And so you decide to grip and step and move and turn and do all those different things. Um, always keep in mind that your default behaviors are gonna be hands first and feet first, then elbows and knees and shoulders and hips. This is not because it's the best way to work. It's because it's how your nervous system is, where your nerves are most dense. So it's just easiest to move exactly how I want with my hands. And then not as easy, but still pretty easy to move my feet where I want them. And then elbows and knees, and then finally shoulders and hips. So your focus actually should be on productive movement of the shoulders and hips. And I'll give you a trick for how you can do that in a moment. And anytime you find yourself thinking, what grip should I take? Probably the answer is anything because the other parts are not getting any attention. Your knees may be out of place. Your elbow may be away from your hip, something like this. And you want it to be a grip problem because a grip problem, you just solve by grabbing and you just solve by grabbing. But is it, it's rarely the actual problem. It's just the one that seems like the problem because we're so good with our hands. Um, when you, have the wherewithal when you're moving around to focus on shoulders and hips that's still pretty tough to do if i was like turn your shoulders and your hips in some way that imitates jiu-jitsu that can be tough to do easiest way to, to cut through all that turn your eyes and turn the knot of your belt okay if you want to move your hips and shoulders just turn your eyes and turn the knot of your belt and you'll, your hips and shoulders will move very easily all the time i see people they will be looking at me to demonstrate the technique so their eyes are not turning and their shoulders and hips are not quite making the move that they want to make and it's flattering and I, I am looking at you i'm seeing you get the technique right awesome but let your eyes turn let your eyes turn it's going to make it so much easier you know so you let your eyes turn the shoulders and hips will take care of themselves um so those are just some general um some general thoughts to keep in mind about how our actual physiology is uh laid out and how some parts of it can be a little more difficult to uh, consciously control than, than others. Um, doesn't mean it's impossible, but it is something we want to sort of be aware of when we're practicing and just remind ourselves, shoulders and hips, let's turn the eyes, and essentially the grip will take care of itself, okay? Um, this is a topic I'll probably want to go into soon, which is talking about um, the notion of priority versus perfection. Um, oftentimes uh, you probably have this, a similar experience where you want to do the mechanically perfect technique and, and you should, especially if you're just drilling against a static partner. Every single step is razor sharp from start to finish. Very good idea. Then the reality is when you're sparring, the, the, you, you've all sparred. I'm not even going to give you an example. You all know what that's like. So there's a conversion that has to happen between the between seeking perfect mechanics and then being able to prioritize mechanics when it comes to sparring, right? Um, so you've you've seen before when you're sparring with somebody who's totally new and they have no idea how to pass your guard and they are just frantically going side to side and up and down, left, right, and they, they're moving a lot, 
but they don't know what to prioritize, so they don't actually create any sort of danger for you. Versus, uh, for example, when I roll with Jiva, I, I would be hard pressed to describe exactly what he did to turn me into a single atom or molecule and then throw <laughs> me out of the room. You know, it's like, because, because the priority that he has is so effective and so subtle that it's almost imperceptible at times. Now that's not really something you should ask of yourself like today or tomorrow, but it relates to what I just said a moment ago. What are you most likely going to prioritize if you're unsure what to do? Grip. Okay, and that's fine. Grab something, but don't have it be your only priority. Don't go grip to grip to grip to grip to grip stop. Grip to grip. Grip. That was my impersonation of you, Dave, the, the stop part. It, right? it's, it's not just not grip. <laughs> um, but, but, you'll, but you'll notice that... Oh, they're, they didn't know what they were talking about. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna have to rewatch that part so I can make sure that I got everything. No, no, it's great. I just... I gotta, I gotta, my, my, my brain is, is not as used to it as it used to be, Dave, I'm missing. Um, so, so, so just, just to bring it sort of back to where was, what I was just talking about is, um, you know, you do want to seek out a uh, mechanical perfection when you're drilling. Bear in mind, when it comes time to spar, things shift a little bit. The way that they shift is in priority. I can't do all the steps before you do something. I need to have some sort of priority. Depending on what I want to accomplish, I can, uh, I can know what my priority should be. If I'm ever just totally unsure of what to do, I prioritize that you can never control my head. Hey, Billy, good to see you. Hi. Hey, good to see you. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm doing all right. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Come on. Come on. <laughs> all right. So, Back to 65 miles an hour. Um, so, you know, just, just just always bear this in mind because it's something that can um, that can be a source of confusion because there's this I don't remember what to do when I'm sparring, um, or uh, you're drilling and you're kind of like, oh, I don't know if, how would I actually manage to pull off all of these steps, which are both legitimate thoughts, but for the context that they're in, drilling you are able to pull off all the steps. Let yourself be fully absorbed in trying to find that, that mechanical perfection. Or another way to put it is, every repetition should be a little bit easier than it, the prior one, but no less effective, okay? Uh, better would be less effort, more effective, but at a minimum, less effort each time for the same result, okay? That's, that's roughly uh, static drilling. And then sparring, Priority. What is my priority? What do I think my priority is going to be? It's probably going to be hands. So what am I probably forgetting about? Legs, knees, elbows, shoulders, hips. Um, and also know that your training partner likely will have the exact same flaws expressed. So when you see them reaching, 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 reaching for grips, you know they don't know quite what the priority should be. So let them reach for grips. Don't just hand fight them. Grab their leg, move your legs, use your elbow to block their grip, and arm drag them. You know, there's a, there's a lot of ways you can get creative with uh, with this sort of generalized knowledge. Um, okay, well, I'll leave it at, at that. I think there's uh, probably a couple things in there that uh, we can come back to uh, in the future. Um, I had asked a little bit earlier. You guys don't have to answer now. You can uh, maybe just think on it a little bit. But um, I would like to have a schedule going forward so that we can do this more. Um, I'm happy to do at least each Tuesday. Um, I'm happy to do like Mondays and Wednesdays at a little bit earlier or later time. Um, Thursdays at the same time. I mean, you guys know how schedules work. You guys know how many, you guys know all these things. I'm not telling you anything new. Um, but please feel free to tell me, Tim, this was what would be just so awesome for me if you did this. And I'd be like, awesome, thank you. And I'll, and I'll put that down. Um, but other, if I don't get anything, then I'll just sort of send out a schedule and, and maybe we can adjust it from there. Um, did anyone have any uh, other questions or thoughts? It's been so long since I've seen you guys and it's even just seeing you in the, in the, in the, in the, in the screen, I guess. Huh? 
Who are, Who are you? you? Yeah. I don't know, but I just found myself in this gray room. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Geo, anything? That's so good to see you guys. Oh, yeah. likewise, I'm likewise. I'm really happy to see you guys. Yeah. After dealing with knee surgery and a terrible ankle sprain, I'm just so ready to do. go back in the mud, roll with you guys. And just blow out a shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, in in um, another another note, this is something that I'm I'm like not so uh, I don't have a set thought on this, but um, I'm wondering like about what kinds of environments you guys would want to come back to. Um, be, let me let me let me throw out some extremes here. Um, everybody has to be vaccinated with everything until and that and until then. That's not I'm not I'm not happy with the environment until that that's a fine vote to take There are other votes to take. I'm just not gonna assume I can read people's mind So if you guys have thoughts on that, I'm happy to be educated and to sort of like get a better Understanding of the like of the zeitgeist of everybody at, at Robo. It sort of seems most people around at the moment are vaccinated. We're all people around me are all vaccinated. Okay. I know. Okay. That's okay. not the best matter. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. Some, who, 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 Oh hey, Jonathan! <laughs> I knew something happened. All right. Hey, hey guys. I missed hey, you guys. Hey. If if you guys do get a moment, uh, you know you're just wanting to send me an email and you want to have a reason to send me an email, please just write it down because uh, I'm not going to send it to the government or anything like that. I just want to be able to tally things up and sort of get an estimate of, of what people want. Um, that will definitely help me in in moving forward. Um, and figuring out what to uh what kind of environments to do i'm thinking that i'll probably do like a lot more classes per day that are smaller um and sort of have people block out times that they're going to come in um because it's always going to be trade-offs you know it's, it's like huge room or whatever and i'm fine with the trade-off where i'm teaching a lot more classes because i would love to do that and so it's one of those rare instances where one of the trade-offs is actually something appealing to, to me so i'm happy to do that um but again like i'm not going to pretend to have more information than all you guys uh so any and all feedback would be lovely um uh, as of now i'll plan for thursday at 6 30 um unless i hear just like tim you gotta do tomorrow at 6 30 if i get that then i'll do tomorrow at 6 30 okay you don't have to I'm get sorry, crazy sorry, with me yeah but otherwise, Thursday, 6.30, and then Tuesday, Thursday's going forward. If you guys are liking it, we'll add more days, um, and I'll keep you guys updated on uh, what kind of spaces I'm finding and stuff like that. Yeah? Wonderful. Wonderful. It is absolutely, absolutely the highlight of, like, I can't even say to see all of you like this. You know? Like, I, I here, I was like, we could do a, uh, like workouts where we're social distance and like, to, and I was like, we're, we're, I can see people saying they're going to do that. And then people arrive and they're just like, <laughs> and they're just wrestling each other next to the dumpsters and stuff. I was, it's just, uh, I know that I have that sentiment in my heart. And so I know I'm not the only one with that. And I was like, it's not realistic for us to try and <laughs> try and do that. Um, but anyway, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys this way at first and then uh, back in our, our new habitat sooner rather than later. Alrighty, have a good night, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Bye.